Thanks all uh, for uh, sticking around to the end. Uh, I know you're actually really just here to get ice cream after we're done, so uh, that's cool though. Um, nonetheless, I can talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're doing with data at Twitter. Um, and before I get into that though, I wanted to say that the, this conference has been uh, one of the most diverse ones that I've been to. Uh, it's great to see all the Postgres guys here uh, and participating and uh, asking questions and uh, you know, being nice, and we're being nice, and everybody's happy, and uh, I hope that in the future conferences that uh, we'll have the same sort of effect and that uh, the open source database community can, uh, you know, have a lot more events that are uh, together and, uh, <laughs> and we can share a lot of our knowledge because we all are really solving the same set of problems with slightly different tools. <clears throat> so to start with, of course, I have to uh, throw out the hashtag if you want to talk about this talk. Uh, Using TW data uh, is appreciated, just so we can find it. Um, and then I wanted to jump into um, one thing that I wanted to show, but I uh, wasn't able to uh, for various reasons, is uh, there's an awesome video up on discover.twitter.com if you haven't seen it. Uh, I think it really portrays what Twitter is all about much better than I could. Um, I've been at Twitter for a fairly short time, but um, the, the way that the company operates and the way that the product works and uh, what we've been involved in in that short time uh, is awesome. And I think um, that video captures it really well. Uh, we have some, some guys internally that, that really do a great job. Uh, so take a chance to watch that if you can um, at discover.twitter.com. As Colin said, uh, a little bit of my background, I was a very early MySQL employee um, starting back in 2000 and, and even a contributor in, in 98 and 99. Um, to documentation and such, and uh, I've been doing a lot of things since then, but um, you know, I've contributed quite a bit um, as far as patches to MySQL. I started at Twitter in only November of last year, so about six months now. Um, quick little run through of, you know, what am I interested in? Um, NASA, astronauts, electronics, everything you might uh, possibly care about, and one of the kind of interesting things about Twitter is it allows you to connect to um, really anyone, and one of the anyone's that decided to contact me was another Jeremy Cole on Twitter, uh, who then uh, a couple of other Jeremy Coles piled on, and now we all follow each other, and we can uh, talk about who's the coolest Jeremy Cole. Um, but uh, it, mostly that probably just happened because I happened to be the one that was the first Jeremy Cole, and I got Jeremy Cole um, as my Twitter handle, uh, so then the others get to be slightly jealous of that. So to jump in um, on what Twitter is outside of the sort of um, social impact of it, um, if we think about it from a data perspective, um, and you know the, the scale of what we're handling, uh, which is growing all the time. In fact, uh, I sent these slides to the communications team to approve them, and they actually bumped back and said, hey, those numbers are old. <laughs> um, raise that number up. Uh, so um, we're currently doing about 155 million tweets per day. Um, are going through the system. You can average that out, and, and it's, I think it's 1,700 something uh, on average per second, um, on an average over the entire day, which is an interesting thing. Um, obviously, there are uh, lots of spikes and such that uh, you know, we have to have built the system to support. And um, when you take that out over a week, uh, we're now at the point where we're collecting uh, just over a billion tweets per week. Um, so obviously, that presents some interesting data challenges. So, uh, obviously, the, the part that you're all interested in is, is kind of how do we deal with that. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there at the moment. Um, I'll try to give you some insight. I can't give you, uh, you know, huge swaths of technical detail, and um, I think there have been uh, a lot of other uh, greatly technical talks, and uh, actually uh, Matt Friels gave a, a great talk, which maybe was uh, misadvertised or <laughs> under-advertised as uh, not being the, the awesome way that Twitter does this stuff. but. Uh, the talk on Gizzard, which hopefully his slides will be online, um, is uh, one of the key points within this uh, uh, talk. One more, or a couple more data points. Um, the current record of tweets per second uh, as a sustained record was during this last New Year's, during Japanese New Year. Um, for whatever reason, the Japanese really like Twitter, <laughs> and they really like to say Happy New Year to each other on Twitter. Um, and we got just under 7,000 tweets per second uh, during that as a peak. Uh, you know, above and beyond all the normal tweets that are happening around that time. And the current growth rate is uh, around 460,000 new accounts per day uh, being created. Uh, and of course, all those people need to send lots and lots and lots of tweets. 
So uh, jumping into just uh, you know, how we go about this, um, to start with a little bit about just engineering culture, and um, I can't claim at all to represent the engineering culture across Twitter myself. Uh, I think it's, it's a great group of people that um, really have their minds in the right place and their hearts in the right place and technology usually in the right place. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, some of the things that go into that, um, starting with just a good sense of pragmatism, of um, you know, using what's available, uh, using commodity software and hardware, not trying to build you know, big uh, closed source architectural components or anything like that. Um, using the best tool for the job, uh, which may not always please everyone, uh, but is, you know, gets the job done. And in many cases, building new awesome tools if needed. Uh, if we run into problems where we, uh, you know, we can't find a tool that is in existence that solves our problem, uh, build something new, and in many cases, open source it. Uh, and you can look through, uh, I give some references towards the end of some of the projects that we've built, and you can use them yourself to build your own Twitter. Um, and bringing that back into this conference um, is really the point that you know, we use MySQL when it works, and we use other things when MySQL doesn't work. Um, but the core of that being that MySQL often does work. Um, you know, you can, you can jump on to a lot of new tools that have their own new failure modes, and maybe they solve some of your architectural issues. And um, the reality is that um, MySQL does a good enough job most of the time that uh, it ends up being the core architectural component in a lot of what we're doing and in a lot of what all of you are doing, um, even though it's not perfect. And uh, you know, all of the folks, the Facebook folks especially, have done so much digging into it that they can tell you all of its imperfections, and we're very grateful for that, uh, <laughs> for all of the work that they've done to make things better. Uh, we'll certainly uh, be sure to steal all of that work <laughs> at the appropriate moment in time. Um, but um, the second sort of key principle here is uh, loose coupling of components. Um, using queues and using asynchronous processing to, uh, to process the tweets as they come in, but not necessarily uh, at the same speed every time. Um, so that in most cases, if something breaks along the way, uh, the worst case is that things get delayed rather than the site is down and you get the fail well and everyone loves the fail well, but uh, we don't really like to see it all that much. Um, and of course, that's an aspirational goal because every time something new breaks, you realize that something wasn't terribly loosely coupled um, and it, in fact, pushed back way too hard on something else or it just fell over or whatever. So, um, so that's always a, a moving target of trying to make things slightly looser um, and we're always finding new things that are uh, stuck together really well. And people are building new things that are stuck together really well sometimes. <laughs> um, Another uh, sort of key principle here is um, soft launching things so that we can decouple the concept of actually pushing a release out and driving new traffic to something so that um, you know, we can launch new code in a disabled state and we can turn it up slowly and turn it back down if we need to. That's a common principle that big organizations use, but it's one that um, you'd, be, you'd be wise to, to build into your system very early on uh, because it gives you a lot more flexibility in uh, you know, when you add a great new feature that has release, uh, you know, stringent database requirements, um, after you've turned it on for 1% of users, you can then decide that it's really not working and you need to re-architect something and uh, turn it back off or turn the percentages down or um, use that to moderate, you know, what's coming into your system. Um, what that allows you to, to do then is to quickly iterate and improve on things without having to worry about uh, breaking them too badly in production. So if you've rolled something out to 1% of users and you realize that it costs 10 times as much in the either user experience or performance of the system than uh, you expected it to, uh, you can quickly you know, turn it off and uh, iterate on it, build new architectures, write new code, fix bugs, fix infinite loops, those sorts of things, um, and push it back out. So looking at um, how we are using data at Twitter, um, I can't give a whole lot of numbers about the exact scales of the data, but um, we'll first jump into uh, how we're using MySQL and then some more general things and maybe s dispel some myths. Um, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons that we use MySQL um, are you know, the, way, the areas where it really does win for us, uh, that it's quite fast usually. Uh, NODB is awesome and um, you know, it's, it's a very robust uh, way of storing data. Uh, we generally don't have any sort of corruptions that are caused by NODB that lose data. We have machine failures, we have those sorts of things, but 
Um, actually, I could probably think of and count on one hand the times that I've had InnoDB actually corrupt data itself because of a bug or because of another reason. Um, and then replication usually works. Um, we are, of course, at the scale where there are lots of places that replication doesn't work, and that's um, one of the areas that we've probably done um, the most work uh, to you know, work around some of that. Um, for a lot of the smaller things, a lot of the, the peripheral services that we build, of course, they are just using MySQL replication. They're using pretty stock MySQL because it's easy to use, it's easy to run, it's easy to build new things, it's easy to deploy them, it's easy to test them. Um, it's easy to run MySQL on your laptop and, and have a full development environment. It's not so easy to do that when your you know, core architecture includes you know, heavily sharded components that uh, you can't really represent locally. A couple of interesting data points just on, on how MySQL can win. Uh, you know, uh, we did some data center migration work recently, as has been in the news, um, and during that process found a lot of stuff that's been running for a long time. Um, you know, we had some machines that have uptimes over two years, um, but you know, one machine that I ran across just uh, as a random case, a uh, pretty busy machine that's been up for not even quite a year, 212 days, um, and uh, I just thought that some of the uh, stats that it was returning were kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> that it's, it had processed 127 billion queries in its time up, which is an average over the entire duration of almost 7,000 per second nonstop for 212 days. Um, and the InnoDB numbers were even more interesting. Um, 1.36 million rows read from InnoDB per second for 212 days sustained. Um, with no problems, obviously, otherwise it would have crashed. So, um, so that's, that's one of the reasons that we are still using MySQL as a core architectural component, uh, even though we may not be using it in the traditional fashion in a lot of places, is that uh, that performance is what we're aiming for, that longevity is what we're aiming for. So where does MySQL not <laughs> work? Um, ID generation is one of the sore points. Um, you know, one of the things that breaks first, I guess, in a larger system is if you try to use it to generate IDs either through um, typical transactions or just uh, especially through auto increment. Um, doesn't really have real sequence support, so that's one of the areas where uh, we've had to replace some, some parts of it um, with external components. Um, by itself, it's not really good for graph storage, um, for managing connections from person to person. Uh, things like the followers graph, you can't really, you can manage that up to a very small scale uh, with SQL directly, and beyond that, you really have to get into some much more complicated architectures because your queries get just dumb, uh, where you start passing millions of items in, in lists and such to find uh, matches. Replication inefficiencies um, hurt us a lot. Uh, the fact that it's single threaded, some of the stuff that's being fixed, um, and replication lag gets in the way quite often on the systems that we're still using replication for. Um, and you know, overall, we value stability and performance over the fancy new features, so um, really a lot of the work that's going into 5.5 and 5.6 is right up our alley of um, make the thing more stable, make it performant, um, you know, make NODB better, um, rather than add a bunch of new sort of uh, syntactical features that we don't actually need or use. So what is MySQL's happy place um, within Twitter? Uh, we use it as is for all the smaller data sets, um, and smaller in this sense is typically uh, less than or equal to half, one and a half terabytes, um, which is really just a, a limitation of uh, 24 disk, 146 gig RAID array. <laughs> um, going beyond that um, brings in some interesting hardware challenges in scaling hardware up, which isn't something you don't want to get into too much, um, and also gets into some uh, data size challenges around just copying data around. Uh, taking a long time. Uh, so this is a pretty happy place for the uh, ability to create a new slave, to restore things from backup, et cetera. And then use it as a permanent backing store for larger data sets, building on top of it so that um, anything that it doesn't do or that we need it to do, uh, we can manage to do. And like I said, the, the happy place may be expanding with uh, especially 5.6, some of the new stuff there looks pretty awesome. So um, when we look at data at Twitter specifically, uh, some of the tools that we have developed, and um, many of these are open source projects. Uh, there's a system called Snowflake, which is the generating of unique IDs within the Twitter environment. Uh, if you really uh, pay attention uh, a few months ago, you could have noticed that uh, tweet IDs switched to this much longer ID number uh, at some point, and uh, 
perhaps caused some of you some heartburn if you were JavaScript programmers um, when we exceeded 53 bits and caused some problems for JavaScript. Um, but Snowflake uh, generates unique IDs and it's a distributed system. Um, the idea is to generate not necessarily perfectly sequential IDs, but um, ordered by time uh, and to not have to coordinate between them to generate, you, obviously you can't generate perfectly uh, sequential IDs if you uh, are uncoordinated. So uh, the idea is to uh, get pretty close, but not perfect. We don't really need them to be perfect anyway. Um, and it's open source. And that feeds into some of the other systems. So Gizzard uh, is a distributed data storage framework that um, um, was discussed in another session earlier. Uh, it's used on top of MySQL, so it actually uses MySQL internally, and particularly the features of NODB that are interesting, the, the uh, not corrupting your data all the time feature, um, to just use it as a data store. So feed data in, um, be able to get the data out quickly. Uh, don't worry about replication. Don't worry about any of the other fancy stuff. Um, don't binary log. Uh, doing all of those, or turning all of those things off, not using all of those things, uh, gains you a lot in performance. Um, so if you can handle the distribution of data on top of MySQL uh, in another layer, then you can get a lot more out of the individual nodes. And that's kind of the idea behind um, using the Gizzard framework. And then that's really just a building block for other internal services. Um, the Gizzard framework is open source. Uh, some of the components built on it, of course, are, are ours. So they're not really open source necessarily. But um, one of them that is is FlockDB. Um, which is edge storage, or really, uh, in layman's terms, ID to ID mapping. Uh, if you need to store an ID and its relationship to another ID uh, and be able to find those and traverse those graphs quickly, uh, that's really what FlockDB is for. And you can imagine how that relates to the Twitter infrastructure. Um, follow lists, who are you followed by, who are you currently following, who did you block, um, what lists of, of, uh, lists of, of users, um, the Twitter lists feature. Um, so it uses Gizzard um, as its underlying framework. Um, it's, of course, running in sort of an application on top of Gizzard. Um, but it's using Giz the Gizzard framework for uh, sharding the data uh, and distributing across many machines and allowing us an easy way to get that data redistributed so that we don't have to do a lot of really painful operations over time. It's just uh, an incremental growth. And FlockDB is open source. Uh, and you can use most of what we're using it for uh, yourself. T-Bird and T-Flock are, are, are terms that you wouldn't often hear outside of Twitter, but nonetheless, they're uh, an interesting part of the whole discussion. They're uh, the canonical tweet store and um, the, you know, the place where when you tweet, that's where it's going. It's going to an internal system called T-Bird built on top of Gizzard. Um, and then the secondary indexes are in T-Flock, um, which is another whole cluster just for secondary indexes. Uh, it actually replaced a system which we've uh, recently phased out and even in some senses are still in the, in the process of reclaiming some of, uh, which was a temporally sharded um, good idea at the time sort of architecture, um, where you fill up one machine and then uh, you number the next machine number two and then you fill up that machine and you number the next machine number three and you fill up that machine. Um, that's a pretty common temporal sharding architecture, but it has some major architectural limitations, uh, especially within Twitter in that um, most of the old machines really didn't get any traffic because People are interested in what's happening right now, which is kind of the premise of Twitter in the first place. Um, so not only was that very expensive to scale in hardware and, and very logistically complicated for the DBA team, um, it didn't really work over time because um, one of the main flaws that we encountered uh, and one of the reasons that we finally had to turn it off, uh, even though we'd been running both systems concurrently for a long time, is that um, we were filling up one machine in about three weeks. Um, and I, when I say one machine, I mean really, of course, one machine with all of its replication uh, slaves. Uh, so building out a whole new cluster of machines to handle all of the traffic every three weeks um, when these machines are uh, fairly sizable machines doesn't really work from a financial perspective and doesn't really work um, just from a resource consumption DBA team management perspective. Um, so Gizzard allows us then to, um, to have this tweet store that is you know, maybe not perfect in the sense of balancing, but uh, allows us to grow it slowly over time uh, to not have to worry as much about um, exactly when machines are going to fill up and when we have to make this cut off at exactly this date or we'll hit 100% over the weekend while the DBAs are trying to get some sleep. Um, we don't have to make those sorts of decisions as frequently and we don't have to scale as inefficiently uh, cost-wise. 
Some other things that we're using. Uh, a lot of people have asked me this week, doesn't Twitter just use Cassandra for everything? Um, I'm not exactly sure where that whole rumor came about, but, uh, but it's floating around a lot. Um, and of course, now, after that whole discussion, you should know that uh, that's not true. But nonetheless, we do use Cassandra internally for some projects. Um, um, I'm not too familiar with most of them, but the guys that are running it basically tell me extremely high velocity writes and medium to low velocity reads are where it is uh, finding its sweet spot within Twitter, um, and that it offers some, ex some gains on being able to expand the cluster and get more performance out of it, and to run on hardware much cheaper than what we're running MySQL on and much more failure prone than what we're running MySQL on. And uh, the primary feature, the reason that they're using that are uh, high velocity writes and schemaless design. Um, outside of that, uh, a lot of the other data sources go into the gizzard systems. We're also using Hadoop and HDFS internally, um, primarily for the ability to, to process extremely large data sets. Um, traditional MySQL systems, you could potentially do a terabyte, um, perhaps a billion rows or so, depending on the size of the rows, um, maybe a few billion if they're really small. Um, within the gizzard system, there isn't really a limitation, but uh, you're still issuing MySQL queries and you're still having to fetch all that data and, and that's typically a uh, sort of OLTP online system. Uh, and Hadoop is used for all the processing of mostly unstructured, extremely large data sets. Apache logs are all going into Hadoop and HDFS and then being processed offline, batch processed, um, where the data sets may be hundreds of billions of rows each um, and we can turn through them pretty quickly. We're also using Vertica internally, um, primarily for analytics and uh, the ability to uh, do large aggregations and joins um, in a sort of MySQL-like SQL environment um, where the developers don't have to write MapReduce jobs, they don't have to do a lot of extra work. Uh, some of the data sets goes, get streamed or get batch processed into Vertica, um, and then uh, you know, tools can be written on top of those much easier than the sort of semi-offline batch processing nature uh, that Hadoop introduces. So one of the interesting things within Twitter is um, as part of the engineering culture, we like to open source things that we've built, both uh, you know, for the ability to get contributions from outside, but um, you know, one of the, the main things that open source gives you, as many of you know, is the ability to take your work with you when you go and, and to not have to worry about being chained to either uh, you know, what you're working on or, or you know, feeling like you're, you're just doing your day job. Um, you can feel like you're, you're building something that you get to keep that's gonna last a really long time. You're sure that the company is not gonna just kill the project because the code's out there. And if they did, you can keep working on it if you really liked it. Uh, so you can feel free to think about uh, you know, how you're building it and, and what new architectures you should have and uh, all of that while you're taking a shower, while you're you know, driving around, whatever you're doing. Um, your mind can be on it, and, uh, and that's one of the awesome things in open source. Some of the projects that we uh, have out there that are interesting, uh, you can find them all on uh, the links that I'll give on the next slide, um, primarily the GitHub page for Twitter, but uh, Gizzard itself, uh, the, the library essentially for storing uh, data across many nodes, um, FlockDB, edge storage on top of that, Snowflake ID generation, uh, Haplo, Timeline caching is kind of the idea behind it, but um, I can't claim to understand how that all works. Um, Kestrel's a queuing system that we use in many, many ways within Twitter, so when I talk about asynchronous coupling of things, uh, Kestrel is often how that's happening within Twitter. Uh, and then there's a lot of Scala bits and pieces because uh, we're one of the bigger Scala users within uh, the sort of world, um, and Scala is not all that popular of a language, so we've uh, had to build a lot of things and open source them so that everyone can use them. So you can get all of those. Twitter.com slash about slash open source has a lot of uh, references and uh, some of the bigger projects. And then the GitHub page has uh, really everything that we're working on. Uh, so definitely, if you're interested in how Twitter's built or you're really interested in how Gizzard works or you have to face some of the same problems that we've faced, um, those tools are working. Uh, you know, they're working really well for us. Get them and use them. Contribute to them. Add new features. And uh, if you really like them, Join the flock, which is how we say, uh, come work at Twitter. And if you uh, are familiar with the recent trend on Twitter, uh, there are lots of jobs that you can get, and uh, you can be a winner too. And thank you all. Uh, I'll be around for questions, and I can take them now.
Hello. If you have a question for Jeremy, uh, please head up to a microphone. Nobody has any questions about how Twitter works. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, so version-wise, we have uh, a kind of mixed deployment, a lot of it legacy. Um, so we have 5.0 and 5.1 primarily. Um, not all the same version all around. Uh, I think we have about six or seven different versions deployed right now. Um, that's changing over time. Um, so during this year, we will upgrade. Uh, I can't necessarily say what version yet, but uh, we're evaluating the possibilities right now. So um, ideally, that would be um, either a very late 5.1 or 5.5. Yeah. Configuration. Sorry? What's a typical server configuration? Hardware. The typical hardware configuration. Um, pretty standard. Uh, so basically, I think I can say whatever it is. It's, it's not all that uh, unique. Uh, so HP DL380, 72 gigs of RAM, and 24-disc RAID 10 is a typical database configuration. And that, that gives you a pretty good balance of uh, the memory that you're, that you're working on. It's not perfectly cost effective. <laughs> there are lots of cheaper platforms, and especially now with SSDs and such, there are a lot of options for us. But um, we also have a lot of big problems to solve. So <laughs> uh, solving hardware problems is not uh, at the very top of the list, but it's close. Uh, I think you could say data mining is primarily happening on the Vertica and Hadoop side, um, where they're basically streaming data sets into uh, HDFS, processing them with MapReduce jobs, and um, they're adding new stuff to that all the time. If things are really interesting and we need them in closer to real time, uh, those typically would end up on the Vertica side or as uh, just raw reads directly from MySQL. So. Others? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Could you, could you re-ask it with the microphone? Yeah, what, what are the top problems or issues on your list? The top problems or issues with? Uh, at, at Twitter, I guess, on your list ah. of solutions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on who you are, really. <laughs> Um, the top problems and issues with MySQL are, are um, mostly fairly mundane, uh, things like moving data around and building new systems and, uh, and that. Uh, but you know, on, the, on the bigger scale, uh, Twitter's a, a, in a, a phase of sort of explosive growth where um, you know, even from a capacity planning perspective on the database side where it should be kind of mundane, um, we're continually proven wrong on, on our capacity predictions for things, which is annoying uh, when you're trying to buy hardware and you're trying to, to plan projects and such. Um, but you know, the, the ability to, to sort of make a prediction for when something should approximately be done and then uh, be cut short by uh, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the time, uh, just be due to natural growth and due to world events and, and other things, um, makes things pretty challenging. <laughs> um, so things that we thought might last you know, X months end up lasting half of that time um, and having to, and, and engineering is a continual challenge of, you know, not necessarily implementing the best solution every time, but implementing something that you think will last long enough to either get you to the next best solution or, um, you know, to, to be a more permanent solution. And uh, that's, that's very difficult to do with, with explosive growth. Uh, questions? Yeah. Had, oh, sorry. Did you guys had uh, any difficulties during those events on Middle East on technical side? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I I don't know of any. Um, I don't know if there's an official company line on that, but I don't know that we had any problems during those. Uh, even the um, the New Year's. So we we had a peak uh, in traffic actually from the Japanese New Year uh, that I mentioned before and. I don't think we had any problems doing that either. 
Um, so, you know, maturity-wise, we're certainly uh, getting a lot better in that, you know, major world events or sporting events usually don't take us down. <laughs> um, that used to be the case in many years past where there would be a major event and, and uh, you know, the capacity just wasn't there uh, to support it or some architectural component wasn't there to support it. Um, that hasn't been happening primarily um, recently. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of any capacity-related sort of outages recently. Yeah, go ahead. Also a good question. <laughs> Primarily because, so yeah, so I'll the question. She's asking if we use statement or row-based replication. Um, and it's primarily statement-based right now, but that's largely a factor of the, that we have 5.0 and 5.1 both in production. And, um, and additionally to that, we are kind of hesitant to switch to row-based replication in a lot of environments because you lose a lot of insight into what's really going through the replication stream, uh, which is a bit unfortunate uh, and maybe a feature request in some sense. Um, I don't know if that's been solved in more recent versions, but um, okay, five, six. <laughs> um, so that insight to us is, is many times uh, critical to be able to look back at the binary logs and, and summarize them and see what statements went through them. and. Um, you know, as we're looking at capacity planning, as we're doing other things, particularly with 5.0 and 5.1, that's been, that's been very important. So we have to either replace that ability with uh, code or, um, you know, ensure that we have that ability in, an, in a version that we upgrade to. Nonetheless, there are performance improvements that we could gain, perhaps, by, by doing row-based replication, because many of the uh, things that we're replicating are primarily one row change sort of, sort of level, um, where row-based replication would potentially be a big win. Uh, well, I mean, they're, they're text, so they're not blobs. So the question is basically, are we storing tweets as blobs? Um, I think the actual column type is a Veracare uh, UTF-8. So, yeah, they're only 140 characters. There's, there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, huge blob storage requirements for that. Uh, they can be stored in row and, uh, you know, there's no real uh, limitations there. The, the only limitations that we'll run into actually are, are related to character sets that uh, UTF-8 in MySQL 5.0 and 5.1 uh, isn't full UTF-8, and uh, I've gotten some heartburn about that already from developers within the company that four-byte characters aren't supported, um, and they want to move to 5.5, and <laughs> that's not a good enough reason to move to 5.5 personally, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's a concern anyway, so that'll be one of the considerations that we use when we look at different versions is, is four-byte character support. Um, Are we using FlockDB for other social graph data? Yes. Yeah, so the, the relationships between users, yeah. yeah. So it's essentially ID to ID mapping store, and, and it stores many different relationships, but, um, but the primary one is the uh, follows graph, basically. Who's following who? Okay. Shall we wrap it up, Colin? Yeah, all right. Uh, so I'll be around, actually, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to come up and we can, we can talk one-on-one -on -one or we can uh, form a little group of people, if you like. Uh, there's ice cream immediately after this. And uh, thank you all. Make sure you come back next year.